All right, I think it's about time to get started. Um, I'm Cliff Lynch, the director of CNI, and um, I welcome you to the uh, this breakout um, session from the uh, CNI 2020 Spring Virtual Meeting. We're about halfway through the spring virtual meeting, which will run till the end of May. So there's plenty more still to come. Today, we have a panel uh, dealing with a really important topic, um, which is how ORCID can form a sort of an um, sort of a armature on which you can hang um, all kinds of research information connected with a scholar um, and how that um, can be employed both in reporting and assessment. Um, we'll have a look from a number of different institutions and um, the panel will be run by um, Sheila Robert, who um, will introduce the panelists. After the panel is done, we will um, take questions and answers. Uh, Diane Goldenberg Hart from CNI will um, be uh, moderating that. There is a Q and A uh, tool at the bottom of your screen, and please feel free to use that at any point during the conversation to pose questions as they occur to you. Um, uh, and um, we'll deal with them all at the end, unless um, someone uh, picks them up in the course of the discussion. So with that, there's really not much more for me to do than thank all of our presenters. Um, uh, um, we're very grateful for you sharing your um, insights and experiences uh, with us on this important topic. Uh, thank you all for joining us. And with that, I will turn it over to Sheila. Thanks, Cliff. So thanks and welcome everyone to our panel session on using ORCID to consolidate research information for reporting and assessment. Um, I'm Sheila Rabin. I'm the ORCID US Community Specialist at Lyricis. Um, and thanks to our panelists, Jan Franson at University of Minnesota, Jane Scott at University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center, and Jason Ranallo and Hillary Davis from North Carolina State University. So today, each of our panelists will be sharing their case studies of how they're using ORCID at their institutions, and then we'll have time for discussions and questions at the end. But briefly before we jump in, just a basic recap that ORCID stands for the Open Researcher and Contributor Identifier and provides a free, unique, persistent identifier for individuals. And then organizations like publishers, funders, and research institutions can become ORCID members and use the ORCID API or application programming interface in their systems to connect with their affiliated researchers' ORCID records which can contain data about the researchers' affiliations, activities, and contributions. And then uh, organizations can read that data from ORCID and also write data to their researchers' ORCID records. So as you see in this graphic, ORCID really works like an ecosystem with the researcher at the center and the organizations that they're affiliated with um, connecting with that researcher. So the more people and organizations using ORCID, the more it can benefit everyone. And it allows for name disambiguation and interoperability of data flow across the research and scholarly communication ecosystem. So that's just a brief overview there. And with that, I'm gonna pass it over to Jan Franson at University of Minnesota. Thanks, Sheila, and good afternoon, everybody. Yes, I'm Jan Franson, University of Minnesota Libraries, and I am the service lead for research information management systems. Uh, today, I'm gonna to share a little bit about how the University of Minnesota Libraries promotes ORCID, why we promote it, and then some of the lessons that we've learned along the way. Next slide, please. Okay, and you can go right to the next one. I'm gonna start talking about why we started using it. Um, I shared a couple of slides today that I've used to introduce our library's leadership to our latest ORCID integration. Now, most people have heard of ORCID, and I wanted to put it in a context that's familiar to anybody in the library world. So ORCID is, of course, an identifier. 
and anyone who's worked with library metadata understands how much easier it is to disambiguate book titles and journals or articles if you have a unique identifier. Disambiguating author names is much the same thing. Everyone gets that, but they might not immediately understand why the library is the appropriate unit to promote or could use on our campus. So when I introduced it to our leadership, I started here. Let's think for a minute about how much time and money it costs when we or someone else at the university has to put together a list of publications by people in a certain department or college. With no unique identifier, that's a pretty heavy lift. And it turns out we've been asked a lot to do that kind of work, to pull together research-related information. We maintain a research information management systems, experts at Minnesota, uh, and uh, I'm sorry, I didn't, I forgot to tell you to advance the slides, Sheila. Could you go through a, uh, forward a couple? There's my dollar sign. Go one more. Thanks. Um, okay, so uh, what could we do if we had an API that we could use to just pull everything for University of Minnesota authors in one place? Um, and that's the challenge we're trying to meet with ORCID. So here's what we've done so far. Next slide, Sheila. Thank you. Okay, so we have three different integrations of ORCID at the university. Experts at Minnesota, I just mentioned, is our research information management system, and that's managed by the libraries. WORKS is the branding we use on Digital Measures Activity Insight. That's our faculty activity reporting system that's managed by our Faculty and Academic Affairs Office. And then just recently, we added an integration to our identity management system on campus. Each of these works a little bit differently. Experts and works can both import from ORCID. Experts also writes to ORCID when something new is added to someone's account. Um, my account, what's added there, it's an integration that allows us, gives us permission, or allows the, uh, the individual to give us permission to read and write to their account. But actually, we're not doing anything with that yet. It exists so that people can tell us what their ORCID ID is. And in the future, we hope we'll be able to push information or pull information from ORCID directly. Next slide, please. We promote ORCID very heavily wherever they let us. Uh, this is a cookie. And yes, we stole this idea from another institution. We found that new grad students and faculty grasp the importance of ORCID for managing their professional identity right away, as soon as you tell them what it's about. Getting them to tell the university about their ID and use those integrations, that's a little more difficult. Next slide, please. So we have a few lessons learned. Um, I didn't put too much in here, but some of the key things I felt were important are important for us going forward. Next slide. The first one is, of course, to pay attention to how others are promoting and using ORCID. Um, that cookie, the cookie idea, that actually came from a presentation I saw Baylor University do back at ACRL in 2017. Um, any idea I hear about from my colleagues presenting here today or others, I try to see, is that, could that work here? Can we plug that in to tell more people about ORCID? Again, it's an easy sell, but they have to hear about it somewhere. Next slide. Okay, so uh, just because everybody seems to get it, librarians, students, faculty, and administrators, they understand why ORCID is a good thing, that does not mean your IT department is going to think that. It was about six years from our first meeting with IT to the launch of that integration with our identity management system. Quite simply, no one but the libraries was asking for it. So while we could describe the long-term value of having a record for a university student and employee ORCIDs, um, there wasn't enough short-term benefit for it to come to the top. Uh, I don't have a magic bullet to solve this one. We eventually got there, and I can only suggest to others that you just keep talking and keep promoting, um, particularly at the administrative level, so that you can maybe get a little bit of a push for faculty to tell the university what their ORCID ID is and therefore have IT put together a place to put it. Um, we're thinking that Science CV might be uh, part of the trick here, and I believe that Jason is gonna talk about that a little later on, so I won't. Next slide, please. Um, so I mentioned a couple of the integrations that we use that are integrations set up by our vendors, by, uh, uh, for Experts of Minnesota, it's Elsevier's Pure, for Works, it's Digital Measures. So if you don't like the way your vendor is using ORCID, or if your vendors aren't yet, 
you should work with other clients and advocate for a change. If you can band together and tell them how you want this to work, what kinds of information do you want to be able to either push or pull and how do you want it to look? Uh, in my experience, that can be, it can be really useful to band together and they are listening to that. I think Sheila has some more information about, about that, about uh, uh, boilerplate messages that you can send to get through to the vendors. And with that, I'm gonna pass over control to uh, Jane, I guess, is next. Thank you, Jan. So my name is Jane Scott and I'm at UT Southwestern Health Sciences Digital Library and Learning Center. And I'm here to tell you about our own integration strategy and what we've been doing. Next slide, please. So we started ORCID from, um, from a, an administrative push. Um, and, and particularly that came about for the need for more grant and accreditation reporting information in regards to citations. Um, a lot of the administration is always tasked with that arduous um, burden of trying to get people citations and get information, particularly with return on investment. Um, and that um, made our push to get ORCID actually quite different than, um, than JAMS institution because they wanted it now and they wanted it immediately. So, so that was a great um, benefit in, in, our, um, in our journey and that um, we had the uh, support of the administration that wanted to get it done as soon as possible. So the focus on um, the information that we were grabbing in terms of the, the community that we're taking, we're actually not faculty because we also do have peer uh, and influence through the UT system. So the faculty are pretty well cited and, um, and cultivated. So the, the def deficiency and the deficit was in the learner community of over 4,000, which includes students, postdocs, and clinical trainees. So that need for long-term tracking, we got a lot of training grants with people that we need to know how they're doing five, 10, sometimes 15 years out, was really the utmost importance um, of, of doing that. And it was also a very collaborative approach that were based on needs and deliverables. And it's amazing what can be accomplished when you have administrators um, pushing those buttons um, to get uh, servers set up and things like that. So, so um, I did a previous webinar that goes a little bit more into that if you are curious about that, but next slide, please. So what have we done with ORCID so far? So some strategies that we've implemented um, have been a, a mandatory ORCID registration for all learners. Uh, and that was a formal campus policy that we actually had approved um, and, and you know, um, respected. So that was something you know, that we needed to show that we legitimately cared about this ID and we needed to do that by making it a mandatory requirement. So that was the first step that we took in, um, in that. And so along with other things regarding, I don't know, an address or a specific, you know, an, an active telephone number or whatever, the ORCID registration ID is included in that uh, now for all learners uh, as, a, as a campus policy. Um, we also use uh, a registration training model during our onboarding. And that was something that's come about. This process um, started, you know, a, a couple of years ago and we, I, was kind of taking the, the lead on it the whole time. And I have a bit of a marketing design background and I wanted to see what would work. Would emails sent from me work? Would emails sent from a dean work? Would a, um, would a training module within a, you know, HIPAA training and everything else work? And we tried all of these different ones and we came to some conclusions, which I'll share about what worked the best um, in terms of that or what worked differently depending on the population. We also have uh, the importance of creating an ORCID culture. So our institutional repository, which the library uh, obviously administers, we made it mandatory that you have to have an ORCID to submit there. So that means that our graduate students will have to have an ORCID at some point because if they're gonna submit a thesis or dissertation, for example, or medical school, depending on different requirements or posters. So that um, created that kind of culture. Additionally, I do poster template consults and I'm kind of one of the only areas on campus that does that. So I made sure to include an ORCID ID in the template so that people kind of know, oh, I guess I'm supposed to do that there or whatever, things like that. So finding ways that we can um, uh, confirm that information as valuable um, within curriculum, within various steps of the process. Um, and then also using the ORCID with other author profiles to work smarter. So this was something that I came in, I'll be happy, I'm just gonna share you the statistics about that, that I kind of knew going in that um, the idea of the ORCID program was one that I think was a little bit of a, 
a, a far-fetched idea and that, for example, an ORCID ID would magically submit everybody's uh, scholarly activity just with a click because of a number of being registered. And I had a feeling that wasn't the case, but the goal of this whole project was to get citation information, to get that information. So how are we gonna go about doing that? So in the process, I wanted to kind of see, have a, have a basis of where it would come from, and that would be a Scopus ID, which we have a subscription to. Uh, and it also is what generates Pure. So working with that, so we could potentially work with our campus partners that are already familiar with that resource um, to expand what they need to, but then on top of that, provide an alternative source of information so that we wouldn't be leaving people high and dry when they said, hey, can you run an ORCID report for me? And we come back with very little results. So, um, so that was actually a sub project that was created as a result of making sure that we, we lived up to the mission that we were slated to do, but also that we had, um, we could work conjointly with it. And then lastly, um, an actual Scopus ID collection process by myself of over 4,000 learners, which I'm about 3,500 into right now. Uh, next slide, please. So here's the results by the learner group that we've had. Um, and uh, I've put a little notation of what kind of um, outreach we did to that. The medical school was our first group um, because they were about to lose their MS4s to graduation. That was a year ago. Um, and so um, we did do primarily email and then some online training. And we are at 96.63% ORCID registration. Of those records, about 43% are reliable for actually pulling information but recognize that that includes 56% of that population that doesn't have a Scopus ID. So if you have nothing to contribute, then you're in compliance. But that does mean that we have potentially 56% of that population that we don't have a, a reliable Scopus ID on for pulling information yet. So it's definitely a starting, but it is something that needs to be cultivated. With the graduate school, we've got about 75.2% um, compliance. They have a longer duration of time, so they um, are, you know, work within that parameter, um, and about 76.3% Scopus, and then that 19%, they have a less amount of Scopus IDs because they publish more, um, and we have about 16.8% that have that reliability. So they have ORCID IDs, but they don't necessarily populate them. For postdocs, we kind of see the opposite of that. They actually are very, um, are not too, well, uh, actually, no, they're still in the middle about that, but they're 99% Scopus compliant. Um, and 92% ORCID compliant. So they come in with ORCID and, um, and uh, they're, they're the easiest ones to be able to find records, merge records and whatnot. Um, and then school health professions, that was solely based, 70% of that was just based on our online training module. We didn't do any email to that. So we didn't, all we had to do was create a module and then get her done. So that's really, um, really a, a testament to our, why I would suggest the online module. Um, and then we have the graduate medical education, which I'm still in the middle of, and they kind of follow some postdoc medical school. Next slide, please. And uh, just to kind of finish up then, the onboarding module has been one of the most effective and time management ones. So that's something you would assign as a, as a training module for any online enrollment curriculum. Uh, assessing ORCID participation, you kind of have to understand what you're gonna get from an ORCID record. If you are putting the guise of we need ORCID because we want to grab citations for people. Also establishing profiles with Scopus, maximizing that. Adding your Scopus ID to Scopus, uh, to your Scopus ID is a way that you can really provide that coordination uh, and, uh, and encourage that with, with when you're merging records or whatnot to people to attach their ORCID so that that, that benefit can happen and we can uh, you know, produce those results. So, and that's it for me. Um, hi, we'll go ahead and get started for NC State, if that sounds good. Um, next slide, please. So um, uh, I'm here with my colleague, Jason Ranallo. We're both at the NC State University Libraries, and we're really excited to be part of this panel and have the opportunity to share um, our work with the CNI community um, about how we've leveraged ORCID with uh, requirements to use uh, Science CV to create biosketches for um, NSF grants. Uh, as Brief context, NC State's a really large comprehensive university. It's globally recognized for science, technology, engineering, and textiles. We have about 34,000 uh, uh, students, faculty, postdocs. Um, our primary funders are NSF, USDA, Department of Energy, Department of Defense. 
Um, and we'll move on to the next slide. So last June, I got an email from one of our research administrators asking for help with uh, this new platform called CyanCV that would need to be used by anyone who was going after NSF funding uh, to create their biosketches for their proposals. And at the time, this um, requirement was going to take effect on uh, January. It's been shifted to June, but that's just around the corner for us. Next. So uh, a small team of us in the um, library got together and we tested CyanCV extensively. Um, and we learned how to use it ourselves. We learned how to integrate ORCID data into it to more easily create these biosketches. Um, and as a result of all that work, we ended up creating this guide uh, that you see on the screen. Um, and it's intended to help researchers see step by step how to connect their ORCID data to CyanCV and also how to create uh, biosketches using Science CV. Um, this guide also serves to empower our research administrators uh, to help them since they're on the front lines um, and they're so integral to this pre-award grant uh, application stage. Um, and we've been excited to learn that our guide has been repurposed by a few other universities. Next. Um, and so as we approach this deadline for the mandatory use of uh, science CV to create these biosketches for NSF grants, we've taken a train the trainers approach. Um, so first we presented at university level venues such as a research administration retreat and the university research council meeting. And then from there, the research administrators started inviting us to present with them at college and departmental level venues, including an NSF career award workshop and a variety of department and college faculty meetings. Um, and since around December, um, research administrators have been sending alerts to their uh, uh, researchers using language that we provided to them um, and promoting some of the services that we will be talking about next. And it's for Jason to take over. Yeah, so the libraries has backed up our support for biosketches with a set of other services. So just a little bit of background information first. This starts in an application called the Citation Index. Uh, you can see the public part of this site at this address. Um, this is an application which collects citations to publications by NC State affiliated people. And this is also the site where anyone can connect their ORCID ID with their university ID. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so through this application, we provide a CV service where we help to bootstrap ORCID records. Uh, this is an improvement of ORCID records uh, that's becoming especially important for our researchers with these requirements coming out of sponsors. Uh, it helps to prepare researchers for these funding workflows, as well as for other reuses of ORCID data. Uh, there are ORCID records only useful in these cases when it's filled uh, with information. Next slide. Uh, in short, we're hoping to accomplish uh, through the CV service is to uh, jumpstart ORCID records by adding publications with DOIs to ORCID and to deal with the backlog of adding publications to ORCID uh, for those things that uh, someone may not have added during the course of uh, more recent publications. Uh, next slide, please. So some more specifics about the CV service. Um, we convert citations from CVs into a machine readable format. Um, we find DOIs for works. Um, DOIs make uh, works in ORCID more reusable um, in outside services like ScienceCV. And then we send publications with DOIs uh, to ORCID on behalf of the researcher. And this is where the ORCID membership and the API key uh, comes into play. Next slide, please. And uh, here are some results. So so far, we've got um, over 900 users have connected the ORCID ID in the citation index. Um, we've added over 22,000 works uh, to ORCID on behalf of users. Um, and we, we were prepared to offer these services before the NSF and NIH announcements uh, around ORCID came out, uh, which put us in a good place to help out uh, once those announcements uh, uh, were made. And we're seeing an uptick in ORCID adoption and our CV service in order to prepare for those deadlines. Um, we prepared a lot of people to be more ready for this kind of uh, funder reuse of ORCID data. 
we previously framed these uh, services around different needs like adding publications to faculty directory pages and annual faculty activity reporting, uh, which is about recent works. But with this funding challenge, um, it's often about relevant works, which might be older, uh, more well cited. Um, so we've, um, uh, this has been the opportunity for us to adjust our services some uh, to accommodate uh, these new uh, funder use cases. Next slide. So we'll uh, wrap up with a summary of the kinds of things that uh, we've been doing and perhaps these are the sorts of things that others might want to consider taking on to help their campuses get ready for this change. Um, so before we got an ORCID membership, we worked on a small scale by taking delegate access to help researchers complete their ORCID records. And we basically did this by taking their CVs and manually adding publications into their ORCID records, again, at a small scale. Science CV also allows for delegate access and that can be used by anyone to help create biosketches or troubleshoot problems or link data from ORCID to Science CV. And we also use that delegate access pretty extensively to do our testing. Um, uh, we do encourage authors to use their ORCID ID when they publish because again, that helps automatically add new publications to their ORCID records, which then they can um, shift up into Science CV for their biosketches. And again, we gladly encourage anyone to repurpose our guide as uh, maybe preparing campus researchers for this new requirement. And um, we definitely encourage folks to begin playing around with Science CV and the ORCID integration. Ask your research administrators to do that and faculty, get some faculty testers as well. Um, our experience of uh, doing pretty extensive testing helped us um, help the NCBI, which created Science CV, do some uh, pretty extensive troubleshooting. Uh, which has led to some improvements. Um, and finally, uh, we have found that this has been a great opportunity for us to deepen our partnership with the research administrators on our campus at a time when they had a clear need. Um, so you may also want to think of this as an opportunity to connect with your research administration unit. Um, they would most likely welcome that partnership. And that's it for us. Wonderful, thanks so much. So I think we're ready for any questions or discussion in the in the last few minutes that we have available. Yes, thank you. Thank you all very much. An interesting assortment of experiences there from a, a really interesting variety of perspectives. Uh, very much appreciate that talk. And I, uh, just by way of introduction, my name is Diane Goldenberg Hart and I am with CNI. And I wanna welcome our panelists and I would also like to extend a welcome to our attendees. Thank you so much for coming to this session today and being a part of CNI's uh, spring 2020 virtual meeting. Um, I would like to open the floor now for questions. If we have any questions, please go ahead and type those into the Q&A box and I will share them with our panelists who will answer them live. And while we're waiting for uh, questions, I just want to share with everyone, in addition to the myriad URLs I already pushed out via chat, uh, here's another one for you. This is the schedule for the rest of CNI's spring virtual meeting, which continues throughout the month of May. So we have plenty more in the program to come, and we hope that you will check that out. Um, Still waiting to see if we've got any questions. And just to add, if you would like to um, ask your question live, or if you'd like to make a comment live, um, feel free to raise your hand and I can turn on your, I can unmute you and let you um, speak directly with our presenters. And I see that we have a question now from Dan. Uh, Dan comments, this, is, this was a wonderful presentation, um, thank you. And for the North Carolina State folks, what is the process for a delegate, uh, delegate to ORCID? Um, also, Penn State has used that LibGuide, thanks for that. <laughs> so, North Carolina. Yeah, so the, the delegate access is just standard delegate access that ORCID provides. Um, and so uh, ORCID has documentation on how someone can um, uh, provide uh, uh, delegate access. What we did is I had a few working with me. And so when, it, at, when we were first starting our service, before we had a, 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 a 
a connection through the API, um, those student assistants uh, were given delegate access by the faculty member. Um, and so they would uh, use the wizards and other tools that were in ORCID to add uh, uh, works to the faculty members uh, ORCID record for them. Since that time, we've developed our integration, which means that we don't regularly take delegate access, but we found that a really great place to uh, get started in uh, you know, thinking about a service and, and working with folks. Oh, that's great. Thanks. Uh, that was a good question. And um, Sheila just chatted out to everyone, if you can see that. In the account settings tab of the ORCID record, there's a trusted individual section where you can delegate to anyone else who has an ORCID ID. So that's really helpful. Thanks. Thank you to Dan uh, for that question and to Jason and Sheila for those answers. And I see we have a question from Robin now who asks, do any of you have faculty with multiple ORCID IDs? Do you work with central IT to get ORCIDs for faculty and students? I see uh, one head shake from Jan. No and no. <laughs> no and no from Jan and Jane. If, if they have multiple ORCID IDs, it's not because we did that. It's it's uh, it's something that they have done. We have not uh, issued our IDs for anyone. I, I also think that the um, the auto assignment was, um, and Sheila might be able to correct me, but was was kind of a test that didn't pass the muster because um, there were because people didn't know that they had orchids. They were linked to their university, and so when they graduated, they couldn't access the orchid ID because they no longer had that email address. So there were a lot of hiccups that I know I've had a couple people on the graduate end of things that were with institutions that had that that are like, I can't access my record because it was used with my .edu email. So I think they're trying to keep it more individualized, um, but you certainly can merge multiple ORCID records um, with, with ORCID um, for that purpose. And they definitely encourage that. And there's also safeguards in place when you register. If you have an email, they're like, I think you already have an ORCID. You already have it registered there. So there are some safeguards in the registration process that help people from not doing that. But ORCIDs are, are an individual's record. And we really can't do a whole lot without their permission and, you know, in that. So it's probably not a good idea for the university to take that active role. Certainly they can push and pull data, but, um, but it's, not, uh, it's a record that's gonna last their career and we might only be a blip in that. So it is, it's, it's not the best position for a university to take on that role in my opinion, because of those factors. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's right, Jane. Just to add to that, um, in the early days, ORCID did allow some uh, institutions that were involved in kind of a pilot to create ORCID IDs for their researchers, but that did not work out for the reasons Jane described. So now um, the individual has to register for their own ORCID ID, and no one else is allowed to um, create an ORCID ID for someone else. Mm -hmm. So that's correct. That makes sense. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for that. And thank you, Robin. Uh, we do, um, we're a little bit past time, but I think we have a little more time. If folks have more questions, um, go ahead and type those into the Q&A box. And um, also, again, I invite you to raise your hand if you'd like to make a comment or um, engage directly with our panelists. And I'll give it a a minute or two more here to see if we have any more questions. Um, I was curious if I may, uh, both Jane and, and Jan made the comments about, you know, getting the word out and um, Jane spoke directly to the notion of marketing um, and just how different it can be when you've got institutional um, buy-in or um, uh, determination to get this going. And Jane, you said that you used, you, you took a look at some different strategies for outreach and uh, to figure out what might work better. Could you share with us what, anything that you learned from that, some takeaways? Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, I, I kind of, you know, was mad scientist about this and really, um, you know, had, had certain ideas I thought might happen so I wanted to test them and see if I was correct in that. So 
for example, the medical school has a pretty large showing. They also had about three or four emails sent out by the, by the research dean saying, hey, you need to do this. Um, and that might have presented a 10% hike every time an email was sent out. We did a library news article, which is like a newsletter starting, thinking, you know, and of course, every library staff member wants to think that like, that's going to get 80% people. And it, you know, got about 20 people. So we knew that like, just like tell, if you build it, they will come, that that just wasn't a reality. In my experience with marketing and things like that, that you, that it's not, people, you need to, they need to know why it's important to them. So um, I actually did a timeline and I'll be happy to share it of what spikes we received in registration based on what launched at that time. And I've been kind of keeping our just records for the last year to kind of see, because I knew that that could be beneficial to all of our peers in terms of like what would work well. And I was really pleasantly surprised that actually that training module that was the easiest to do, it was about 10 slides that basically said, um, you know, this is ORCID. This is what ORCID is not. It's not a Facebook, you know, whatever platform. It's not whatever, what it serves. And then why we're asking you to register. And something we did at the end of it is there's a, a four digit code that it says, put your four digit ORCID code in the bottom. Now between us, ladies and gentlemen, there was no, that, that, that wasn't communicating anywhere, but at least it made people think, oh, I should get this done now. <laughs> and as a result, the, with the four digits, we got 71% compliance of the school health profession, but I actually think that was probably 100% compliance for that group because we neglected to, I neglected to realize that 30% were people that were not going through onboarding because they were already here. So I actually think that we got a high 90% by doing something that we just assign to everybody and then use the internal process of training uh, compliance that we didn't have to deal with. But when we did the emails, I literally did templates where I, I went through everybody's scopus and if I couldn't find multiple ones, this is before I kind of got smart about that, which is a whole other thing, um, then I, was, I would attach a mail merge document with their name, what their scopus ID was, what the URL was, what their ORCID might be, it gave them all the information like a good librarian, library staff would. Those did not do very well mm -hmm. because it was almost too much information. Right. And I also neglected to put the easy proxy link in. So if they were not on campus, which many of this, the, the graduate medical people weren't, then they would end up um, not being able to access that link I was sending them anyway. Mm -hmm. So lessons learned with that where I kept it really simple. Yeah. What's your citation list? Because I can track you down much easier in Scopus and merge multiple records, which was a big issue with a lot of people, you know, coming in is that they had records from multiple institutions. And that's very much the case with postdocs and GMEs, not as much with medical school, but you still have to find their old institution. So with that, you know, there were some challenges with some of these more giving you more information and looking more impressive, like we know all this information actually didn't do a really strong job right. as me saying, what's your citation list? <laughs> and right. then giving it to me and I could type in and get the ID and then tell them to link their ORCID to it. So, um, so there's a lot of different procedures in terms of that. And I was very pleasantly surprised to know that that training module was actually the most effective because it was the least labor intensive of me. And then I follow up with people that have an afterwards, but that's a much smaller amount. Mm -hmm. um, and in the last year we had to grandfather everybody, right? So, so we're looking at a year and you're just looking at the incoming classes of there which is one third, one quarter of, of the population. But to catch up, we had to do the whole shebang of all 4,000 4, instead of maybe 1,000. Right. So that was, that, you know, provided a lot of opportunities of what was right, what, what um, you know, we may have some admin turnover. So I was late to school health professions, which meant we just only did trial the, the module with them. But um, medical school was really on it and really active from the beginning. So. I, I work with them, so we had multiple things with them because we hadn't figured out the processes yet. So, so some of those things, you know, are there's a lot of kind of different variances with them. But the little icons um, showed what procedures were taken. But for school health professions, it was pretty much only that module. But then I went through and got another 10% with an email. Um, so, um, so yeah, so there's definitely uh, you know different things that work. But but my main suggestion is make a training module Interesting. and then you can be assigned to anything.
faculty member, it can be assigned to anybody in your in your institution. And as long as you keep it generic enough where it's you know the UT Southwestern person instead of medical school, so then you have to change them out. If you can keep it fairly generic, then a department, if they want to get on board with ORCID, can assign it to their department. So if you keep it generic, you can actually expand it beyond learners um, and have that flexibility where people can make it a requirement because they assigned it as a training module anywhere in the university. So. Great. Oh, that's, that's really helpful. Thank you. I appreciate that. And thank you to all our panelists. I see we're quite a bit over, over time. So I'm going to just say uh, thank you to our panelists. Thanks again to our attendees. Mm -hmm.